Hello. Today we're going to be talking about some of the software and hardware ideas that we need to tackle the rest of the course and where and how they meet in the middle. Uh, so to start with, it's a good idea to have an eye uh, to think about how we want to operate computer systems. So to start off with, we normally want to use a computer to do something. We have a task to perform, we need some sort of uh, help to do it. So we might want to create a document, we might want to meet up over Zoom, something like that. To do that, we use some user software. This is generally something that someone else has programmed for us that we just download and execute and run. Uh, but to build some software like that, we would generally use a high level language. This is something that's normally got a lot of um, the hardware details abstracted away to make it easier for us to write powerful code. Um, but that's not where we start off with software because we, when we turn on a computer, we're generally using the operating system to use the high level language. So for example, if we don't have Windows, Linux or Mac, then we don't have any way to get to the high level language to actually write and execute our code. A step down from there is assembly language. These are the things that actually make your processor operate and execute instructions. So the moment x86 is, uh, I think, the most popular uh, for laptops and computers. Uh, my laptop is running x86 in a 64-bit implementation at the moment. ARM, I think, has got something like a 90% uh, market cap on mobile devices, so it's incredibly popular at the moment. And then the step down from there, the instruction set architecture. Now, this is what the assembly language implements when it's assembled down to machine code. So some of you will have seen uh, the tiny machine, that was an example last semester, but that's not necessary to note for this class. Next we have the micro architecture, which you should all be familiar with. This is the digital circuitry that makes all of this go. And then from the components of that, the digital logic, or and, ors, nots, xors, everything that we can build up from to make powerful circuits. And that of course is implemented by the electronics layer. So the actual silicon and plastic that makes everything go at the end of the day. So the idea is that we want to go from a simple requirement like making a document all the way down to moving electrons about. So we've already had a look at the bottom few and this semester we will be focusing on the assembly language for which we'll be using MIPS in a 32-bit implementation and instruction set architecture. So MIPS is um, somewhat outdated at the moment but it was very popular in the 90s and early 2000s. We'll be using a 32-bit implementation that's mainly so we don't have to worry about another 32 bits and uh, have a lot more uh, to worry about. Um, there are more popular um, as assembly languages, as I said, x86 is very complicated, but everything you learn in MIPS, you can convert over to x86, uh, whereas vice versa wouldn't necessarily be possible. So this is a good place to learn. Uh, for some examples of what used MIPS, um, the best console of all time, of course, the PlayStation 2 used MIPS for its uh, processors, as did the N64 and the PlayStation 1. Nowadays you'll find it mostly in embedded systems, so anything like a smart fridge or um, a smart thermostat, those sorts of things, there they could quite possibly be using MIPS. Um, okay, so one idea that's uh, going to be quite important in this class, I'm going to say that a lot, we've got a lot of important ideas to cover in this lecture, but when we write code in a high level language, it doesn't just execute immediately, we compile it down to something that is closer to what the computer can actually execute, and generally at the end of the day, a high-level language will be compiled down to assembly language by the compiler. And assembly language is readable by humans, though it's quite difficult to read. So uh, I'm going to stress this continually throughout the semester, but make sure you write comments. Otherwise, I will not be able to mark your uh, code properly because I have no idea what the, uh, it all means. It's very difficult to read MIPS, so make sure you do comments, though it is human readable. Uh, that is then compile uh, assembled down to machine code which is a sequence of bytes that the computer can actually implement on a hardware level so that's the kind of trajectory we're looking at how do we go from the high level language right down to the machine code that the computer can execute um, so before we get there though I'm going to go over some uh, key ideas that you likely have met before but just in case you haven't uh, so let's start with bits so a bit is zero or one with n bits we can represent 2 to the power n distinct values, so 0 is always the first value we can represent with any number of bits, and then we can go all the way up to 2 to the n minus 1. So for example with 1 bit we can represent 0 or 1, with uh, 2 bits we can represent 4 different values, and with 3 bits we can represent 8 different values. And another uh, extension of this is a byte, so computers group bits into bytes and then they um, evaluate them byte by byte. So a byte consists of 8 bits, um, so 8 bits can be stored into a byte, 
and it represents 256 values from 0 up to 255. So these are two very basic ideas to get into your head are what are bits and what are bytes. Now an extension of that, which some of you all have seen, is hexadecimals. So this is base 16. Um, well, we're used to using decimal numbers, which is base 10, and uh, binary is base 2, of course. Uh, but hexadecimal is base 16, so we can have 16 different values in a hexadecimal number. So they go from 0 uh, up to 9, and then 10 is A, B is 11, C is 12, so on, F is 15, and then we go over into the next column. So a hexadecimal digit represents 4 bits. Um, so that's another idea that you need to keep in your head, because a byte which the computer reads is 8 bits, so we can put two hexadecimal numbers into a byte and that can represent everything from 0, 0 up to FF. So here's an example of how you convert um, a binary number into hexadecimal. You can just read the first four to see that that's 5 and then you can read the second four to see that that's going to be 10, which is A. And everyone's favourite hexadecimal number, because we're not very imaginative and there's not very many words you can spell with hex, is coffee, which is um, a three-byte number, and you can see its binary expansion there. And here's just a little table to give you an idea of the, the how the values compare, and that they all have their equivalencies in the different formats. So you have the hex representation, the binary, and then the decimal. So why we would want to look at a hexadecimal is because of the, this idea in MIPS of a word. Uh, actually, it's not just in MIPS, but the idea of a word in MIPS is 32 bits, which is 4 bytes. And they're normally numbered from the least significant bit up to the most significant bit, which we'll get onto in a second. But if we were to write out 32 bits every time, that would become quite cumbersome. So it's reasonable to break it down into bytes and then to break it down into two hexadecimal numbers. So that we can, you can see down here we have the binary representation, and above it you have its translation into hexadecimal. And uh, I think it's a, a much neater way of presenting the information. But yes, a, a word is 32 bits, and therefore it's eight hexadecimal values. Um, they have a least significant bit, and what we mean by that is the bit at position zero always has the least impact on the number at the end of the day because it only represents zero or one. So while it's useful for telling us whether a number is odd, um, it doesn't convey as much information as bit 31, which is obviously going to have a much, much larger impact because it's going to be up to 2 to the uh, 31. Yep, I think <laughs> I get my numbers right. But yeah, so a word, 32 bits, 8 hexadecimal numbers, and that's going to be a key idea going forward. So let's have a little idea about the uh, look at the von Neumann architecture of modern day computers, which is a stored program approach. Um, so the processor, the CPU, is responsible for all of the calculations and decisions that the computer does. Um, so everything that your computer actually executes is going through the processor at some point. And that's why we care about uh, CPU clock speeds, things like that, because it tells us how much we can actually do with our computer, how quickly we can do it. As you can see from this diagram down here, the central processing unit is a little box in the middle. But it's got a couple of arrows going out and coming in from main memory, and that's because the CPU can write to main memory, but it can also receive information from main memory, which it can then operate on. Uh, there's also input and output, like your keyboard, your screen. We're not really going to care about that. That's um, not something we're going to look at in this class. Okay, so let's, let's drill down into the processor. So uh, registers, very important. Uh, they're small areas for temporary storage. Um, so because we're using a 32-bit implementation of MIPS, that's like a 32-bit um, CPU, that means we have 2 to the 32 possible different register values. Um, we'll be going on to registers in a second, but we also have the control unit, which decodes instructions. So as I said to you earlier, we have this sort of mismatch between assembly language and machine code, which is one is human readable and one isn't. So the control unit interacts between here to decode the instructions that it gets into something that it can then execute also moves uh, data between the registers and to and from memory, so it's quite an important part of this whole process. The arithmetic and logic unit um, carries out all of the calculations, it's uh, doing all the adding, subtracting, and it's doing all of the logical operations like your XORs, and that sort of thing. Okay, so as we mentioned registers, there's two to the 32 of them in the, the MIPS implementation that we're going to be looking at. So you can see here on the left we've got the address column, um, because it's 32-bit, each register is 32-bit, so we have all the values from 0 
up to FFFFF, which is going to be the 11111, the highest value. And um, each address has a sequence of uh, bytes, um, which represents its address. And in each of them, they have one bit of data, that's the contents. So um, you can see the contents are represented by two hexadecimal numbers, one uh, four bits each to be one byte overall. But often we want to do more than one byte's worth of implementation at um, a time because one byte at a time isn't super useful. So that's why we have the idea of words, which is um, 32 bits. So let's have a wee look at how we read them from memory. So if we look at the address abadesk at the bottom there, the byte that is stored there is 77. Um, that's what's stored at that register. But we can get a little bit more information out of it by introducing the idea of words and half words. So the half word at abadesk is comprised of the contents of the address register immediately above it and itself. So that would be 8877 in this case we take the one above and the register itself. The word is a little bit trickier. The word at abadesk is represented by the three memory addresses above it and itself. So in this case we start at abba d15f, we read aa and then it's 99, then it's 88 and then it's 77. And so the word is called at address ABBA desk is AA998877. This is little endian convention, which is used by the Mars simulator. It's also used by my laptop. I think big endian is maybe more common, which is the other way around you read from the bottom up, but we'll be using little endian where you read from the top down. Okay, so each MIP, um, MIP register by using this um, stores a 32-bit word, so we can get a lot more power out by using this uh, little endian convention to read more information at once rather than just going byte by byte. Okay, so uh, as we said, we've got a lot of registers. Some of them are reserved for specific purposes. So you can see at the top here, we've got the stack in the heap. Um, the stack is what you push, like a, in Java, you would push your methods onto the stack and then you execute them. The heap is where you put your variables and all that sort of stuff, uh, in Java context, of course. Uh, you can also see that we've got a little sign here saying $SP and that is the the stack pointer in MIPS. So that points to where in the stack we are and you also have uh, other things that point into the heap but we'll be getting onto them much later on in the course so you don't really need to worry about them now. Uh, we also have our static data and then we have our program text which is where your program will be assembled into, stored in registers and then read out by this little PC thing here which is called the program counter. So it tells us where in memory our next instruction is, and then it increments to find the instruction after that once we've executed. And there's some reserved registers for things like the kernel, the operating system, things that we don't really need to worry about and you definitely shouldn't fiddle with yet. Okay, so let's have a look at how we turn this into actually executing code. So the control unit uh, repeatedly just does the same thing over and over again. It fetches the word at the address in the program counter. So the program counter down at the bottom, you can see is 004001A, which at the bottom has the byte 20 in it. So it tells the computer that this is where the instruction is stored. So the word stored at this address, which is 0338C820, or 20, sorry, is the next instruction. So it decodes that. So as you can see, it takes the um, hex number decodes it to add some values together. So once it's done that, it then executes the instruction. In this case, it would need to add the values at T9 to the values at T8, and then it would store them at T9. So uh, when it ex when, once it's decoded the instruction, it executes it by performing the calculation and then storing the values back into memory in the appropriate places. Once we've done that, we then need to uh, increment the program counter so you can see the program counter is now being incremented to the next uh, address, which stores a different word. So it'll go up to AC rather than AB. So it's going to the next place where the next part of the program is stored. So just a quick uh, word on instruction set architectures before we go. Um, we have the similar ideas across our instruction set architectures, which have rules about how we interpret and uh, implement machine instructions. So the execution model is the program counter. You might have different methodologies for how you increment that, how that works with the program. Um, you also have the processor state, the register, as we said, uh, the MIPS that we'll be looking at is only 32-bit, but you could have 64-bit. So you could have a lot more registers. 
Uh, we have operations instructions. So, for example, MIPS has its own set of instructions. x86 has much more because it's very complicated compared to MIPS. Uh, but you have different ways of implementing these instructions. Uh, you also have different data formats. So as we saw, we are using little endian, but there's also big endian. So you could change any of these to come up with a different instruction set architecture. And then yours, your input and output. Okay, so that's everything for today. I uh, hope you found this useful. And uh, please get in touch if you have any questions. Bye.